Okay, so we got our exercise done. Um, it is still before tomorrow by uh, in 55 minutes. It'll be Thursday, but technically I still got my exercise done for day. The goal to, for this week is 110 push-ups every day. However, the factorial like drop-off or even exponential drop-off of how many extra push-ups after 100 I'm getting per day is a little bit concerning, right? Monday 140, half of 40, 20, half of 20, 10. That worries me. So, but anyways, so as I was looking over the code for those few 17 minutes, it seems that the 10 minute rule does not work for me. Um, and I kind of already knew that, right? I, I know when I'm feeling so unmotivated that, you know, just doing something for 10 minutes or even an hour isn't going to like get me back into the groove. Um, so there's something to be said for people who are full of positivity, positivity being full of BS, right? It's just, they got the right chemicals in their brain, and then they think they're doing something magical to make that happen, but it's just they have the right chemical compositions uh, running around in their brain chemistry, right? Um, for me, that seems to be controlled by coffee. Now, we could say that maybe I've damaged my brain chemistry from drinking too much coffee, but Regardless of what you think, uh, the fact of the matter is, that's the way it is now for me. So, so I just realized that pasting this shader code, we need to get rid of these strings, right? So, before we can paste shader string, we need to uh, modify the air macros to not take quoted stuff, right? If we want to make this as simple as possible, right? So we're just going to make a note here, um, please modify uh, P5D uh, 1OGL, 1OpenGL dot FS to not have coded air MSG, right? So we need to modify uh, the code in this file so that error messages don't have quotes around them. Uh, right now, that's the way it is, but we're going to have to fix that. Right now, we just want to get this working. We want to get this compiling, and then we want to stub in our unit test manager. Our, our unit test manager is already stubbed in. It's not called Unit Test Manager, though. We want to stub that in so that we can get... Because right now, some of our unit tests are taking a very long time, right? So this specific unit test is taking a long time. A lot of the Paint 5D unit tests are very intensive because I like test. I do a, like a coordinate conversion test on every single possible data point. Um, so rather than kind of spot checking, I literally check everything. So it's very thorough. The problem is that it's starting to take a very long time for certain tests, so we need to fix that. Well, we're waiting to see if this will ever pass, and I'm pretty sure it'll pass. Though I just want to make sure we didn't introduce any syntax mistakes. Yeah, so this works, and uh, we should probably go on like I don't know LinkedIn and plug ourselves, advertise ourselves. I mean, I don't think that's really getting any... I think the the post gets views, but I don't think that um, anyone actually clicks on my stuff. Um, but the thing is, is... As I realize how hard it is to actually get viewers, I'm not as worried about, oh my god, what if I create this ingenious thing? Oh, that's kind of interesting. What if I create this kind of ingenious thing? And, holy crap... I get it, it's interlaced. Nice. Whoa, but how interlaced? Hmm. Oh, that's that's some good stuff. Um now is it an optical illusion though, or is it 
I don't know if that counts as an optical illusion. Um... Yeah, I don't know if that counts as an optical illusion. I mean... So, remember that when you're arguing with people or you're, um, <clears throat> the main, the main purpose of opinions is to signal in-group loyalty. So, if we want to be suck-ups, we be slightly contrarian, we have to be very careful about how we do it. And, and that is why, you know, you want to say you are correct at the end, right? You don't want to, you don't want to subtract from people's dopamine reserves. Um... We want to talk about how I really feel. I don't. I don't know if that counts as an optical illusion, but but I mean, I guess it depends on your definition. Yeah, I guess strictly it's an optical illusion, but we usually don't think of animation as an optical illusion. Anyways, How do we do this? Should we hashtag C++? Should we just do that? Oh no, how would you hashtag? So, yeah, so... C++ is recommended, but C99, C11, C89? None of that. Um, how about ANSI C? How about um, ISO C, right? Yeah, like none of this stuff, right? So C++ seems to be... I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna... Yeah, so C++ has its tags, or at least it's suggesting tags, but then uh, programming... Okay, but yeah, but programming does not seem to have... Uh, I mean, sorry, um, LinkedIn has hashtags for... You know, it probably has a hashtag for hashtag JS, right? Um, no, it doesn't. But yeah, C++ has hashtags, or recommended hashtags, but not, um, whatever. Anyways, let's, um, close this and stop messing around. And yeah, so this is working. So let's go into our manager for unit tests. And we actually called it something else, right? We didn't call it Unit Test Manager. I honestly don't remember what we called it. Um, so what we might want to do here is let's open up... So we want to curate the code base in a way where we can find stuff when we're looking for it, right? So one thing I might want to do is say in our hashtag file, say um, Unit Test Manager, right? Make a little thing for Unit Test Manager. And then uh, kind of redirect as to, well, where is this unit test manager? Where is this magical unit test manager that we've heard about, right? Where, where is that? 
So we can take this and just make a little hashtag section for it. Why not? Um, so the unit test man hurt. I know how to find what I did yesterday. To find what I did yesterday, all I gotta do is look at the main C file and look at my master list. And I see we have kill test, right? So the unit test ma manager is kill test. Um, the only unit test management we have is a subsystem like silence called kill test that is used to shut off certain unit tests. Um, zero equals test is off. One equals first nesting depth uh, of tests guaranteed. Two equals um, heavy tests that have additional guarding around them will also run. Uh, we could also think it as zero equals no tests, one equals light tests, heavy testing. So, light testing, right, so uh, we have a guard around it, and we have this one enumeration called, I don't know, if kill test uh, is greater than zero, we go into um, the main test function, right? And then when we're inside the main test function, right, so so if we have this, we go into the main test function. If we're zero, we, we don't do that. Then for other things, instead of being guarded with greater than or equal to one, we guard with greater than or equal to two, and that's for tests that are inside those main test functions that need additional guards around them because we found that they take a lot of time, right? So now that we know that, we can close that and we can actually open up kill test. So lib and kill test. And kill test data really should probably look a lot like silence. In fact, it should look so much like silence that we could probably just cut and paste from this, right? So. 8-bit uh, integer, and we just kind of like throw all this stuff here, and silence is all if turned on. That's a pretty good way to do it. But yeah, so we could take this kind of structure here, and we could kind of steal it. We could just steal the whole thing, right? Um, because it's pretty much it's pretty much the same exact format that we want over here, right? So for kill test, we want something like this, and the Kill test, if you look at where it comes from, uh, kill test is over here. So the only thing it's not going to know about that we've already put down is silence. It's not going to know about silence. So, um, we can still keep the same pattern of this thing right here. You know, we silence. Um, if kill test, if this is on, uh, kill everything over, uh, right, uh, so kill all tests override, right, so if, uh, we have a very specific configuration of the tests that we want to run, and then we just want to turn them all off really quick, Um, it also might be nice to, um, turn everything on as well, huh? I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say, right, even though this has a very kind of uniform structure, which says, hey, we could make some type of general container for this or whatever. Because we have such repetitiveness here, and such simplicity, we can slightly break patterns if we want to, if we so desire, right? So we could call this I08. We could make this one signed. 
Um, and this thing, I forgot what this is, so let's go look at what that is really quick in our hashtag documentation. It's for the silence struct, but I think it's for, like, uh, things in main. Yeah, AAC main is a, ficti a fictitious namespace. And it's basically, um... Um, let's update this for a second. Update. AAC main code exists in. So where can we actually find AAC main code? Well, we can go in here and we can go into lib. We actually have a folder called main, right? And the most of the stuff is like dot D and dot F, right? So we can take that and we can say exists in one uh, D. two, and then three, just, uh, whatever. So data, functions, and really anything, anything that is in this folder here. Now, I know I have RG, and technically, you know, other people working on this project aren't going to have an R drive and a G drive, but you know what? I, I don't care. I'm going to keep it like that. But yeah, just for a little update in case we're wondering, well, where where do you want to, where can you find that main code? And that is where you can find that. So yeah, uh, AAC main, we don't have to have that in here. We can just keep kill test. Uh, and kill test is special. And what we're going to say is that negative one, all tests off. Okay. Um, positive one, all tests on zero no override ride behavior right so we're going to use this one to do overrides right like if we want to immediately override and say hey everything everything we're just going to automatically um just do it all You can keep a similar comment structure here. So, has silence code been added? Yes, no, and then a star for uh, there's no actual test code, right? Um, uh, unknown state state um, have not looked at stuff closely uh, yet, right? So we can actually keep kind of like these these things here. We can keep this many. And we can just put everything as question marks at first to be like, I don't know what, what these need to be yet, right? And then from over here, we can say, We're going to say, it's a little bit different, right? So, um, off is actually going to be zero for the way we're going to do this. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna have a guard and say, "Hey, are you greater than or equal to? Are you greater than or equal to one? And if you are, you're on." But we're not just gonna have an on macro. We're gonna have something where there's off, and there's there's like um. There's something here. <clears throat> so there's something here. We don't know what it is yet. And there's something here. So uh, test 
to not test this system. Um, test some, but not all, fast. Um, test everything. Heavy, heavy slash uh, all, right? <clears throat> so I think calling this all is nice. I think that works. That's a, we'll make that a two. And then um, this could be, I don't know, we could do SOM for some, right? Or... Um, or, we just call it level one. So we got level one and level two is all, right? So if we ever want to change that around, we can change that around. But right now we could just do L1 in all. That might be the simplest way. Then all this stuff right here, um, we're going to turn um, so we got off um, technically technically the default is everything is, is all, right? And the reason the default is everything is all um, define So if we have not implemented this, if we haven't implemented any of these, then the default behavior is to is going to be to run everything, right? Because we haven't we haven't implemented any code that's going to say, hey, don't do this, right? So I think the default as not implemented being equal to two. Equals all. So, not implemented being equal to all makes sense, because if um, we haven't implemented any of that code, then it's all going to execute, right? Um, so then we have, you know, off, and then we have L1, and then we have all, and then we have undef not implemented, right? That we can kind of like, if we want to, we can kind of make that look a little bit better. Make a little checksum here for how many things, how many defines actually exist in this section, and there's only four. And um, test some, but not all. Test everything, right? Actually, we could if we have enough room, so we could do this and go, you know, oh one. I could keep the checksum over here as well. Uh, and let's just get rid of some redundant, redundant explanations since we don't really have room for them, right? So, so we don't have room for them, let's just do that, right? So one, two, and three. Okay. Uh, and then this is also, this right here is um, our fourth thing, right? And if we want this to actually work, then we're going to have to do it as a single line comment like this so that we can kind of do this, right? So four things in here. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I don't really feel like doing this, but let's just try to get this working. So anywhere we see silence like this, we're going to have to change that to um, to kill test, right? So it's the kill test library truck, kill test. And uh, we also need to define IO8, right? So 
we decided that at some points we're going to have a signed integer because we want uh, to use kind of a negative value for a little bit more information. And then um, <clears throat> over here we want to undef that 8-bit, right? Undef the 8-bit signed integer. And at the moment this task is done, but the code base grows. This way it can become a to-do final task again. Do not delete error. Finish adding... Um, finish adding so technically uh, <clears throat> this is not um comment out this error if not a current to do but but do not erase from source as this to do will pop back up from time to time. So I think that is a better kind of explanation than what I wrote in the other system uh, of what's going on, right? That this message down here, uh, sometimes we want to just put it back in. And in the case of right now, we actually do want to put this back in. And also, we might want to do something like this. We say, finish adding kill test code for systems, right? So now I got this nice little error message. And uh, it's only going to happen if we say to crash on vital to do. When we say crash on vital to do, it's like, oh, man, we lost track of what we needed to add in terms of code. And if we really ever get to the point where we don't know what needs to be done next, we can uh, configure we can configure the build to say, "Hey, crash on vital to dos." And if we configure the build to crash on vital to dos, then um, this kind of stuff is going to pop up. Uh, comment out. Uh, comment out error if not current to to do, but do not erase from source as to do, right? So I'm just changing the grammar, right? So so as we need to become more terse, we can remove kind of like filler words. Filler words that may actually be necessary to the grammatical structure, but not necessary to the understanding of the comment, right? So I don't... I care that we can understand what this means. I don't care that it's written in completely proper English. I care more about not transgressing this border, then I care about this being proper English. So sometimes when I want to quickly hack this and make sure that it fits, I'll just remove filler words, right? So comment out error if not a current to-do, but do not erase from source as to-do will pop back up from time to time, right? So I still understand what that means. That's fine. Uh, however, we might want to make a note of where we are. So in the time is 28. Uh, 20, how about 23? Make a note of the time. So yeah, so all I'm saying here for the camera, since we just made this here, is that uh, this error message is going to re-pop up from time to time, because as we add more systems, we'll have to make more entries here, and then we have to support them in the code. And because of that, if, uh, if we are actually done with this, then we just want to do this. We just want to comment it out like this. And if we're not done with it, then we want to put this like this. And um, then it's not going to crash the system unless we have crash on vital to do set. So it's just one of these things that if we ever lose track of what we're doing, and we're like, I don't know what to do next. Well, there are, I'm sure, plenty of uh, places where I have vital to do's where I can start adding those vital to do's. So, vital to-dos are things that I absolutely want to do. There's also a thing called a maybe-do, which is a thing that I... It's basically feature creep, you know, like things that I... I'm like, hmm, it would be nice if I had this, but really I'm just wasting time and not focusing if I make it, right? So let's put that there, and then...
let's figure out this. So how many of these things do we care about? And, well, the only thing we really want to care about is this Paint 5D thing. And I don't know if all the systems are accounted for in here, but, uh... The most important thing is that we have this one so that we can start uh, implementing it, right? So Paint 5D, what we're going to do is we're going to, first of all, we're going to go over to where Paint 5D is over here. And we're going to say, um... We're going to turn it on to off, right? We're going to turn Paint 5D off. Or actually, not Paint 5D off. We're going to turn uh, P5D OGL. So this is the um, um, uh, GLSL version of Paint 5D, right? So this is the GLSL version of Paint 5D. That's what this system is here. And we just want to say, hey, let's turn off the unit testing for that. But then we have to implement it. So we're going to go over into P5D1 OGL. And we're going to go find that unit test stuff, right? So we're going to go find it. And there's a mess of stuff. But we see init none. And it looks like init none is the thing that's kind of indirectly executing our unit test, right? So if we go to our unit tests. We can see, oh, here's all the system backup stuff. Here's our private code, right? So um, now when we're trying to turn off unit tests, we're not trying to make a kill switch where we ignore this unit test call. Uh, the purpose of ignoring the unit tests is trying to stop the automated unit tests that, are, that start when the project starts up. So if somebody uh, using this code base wants to like directly invoke a unit test. I shouldn't stop them. I don't think so I think that implement implementation wise I think that that um, the guard for the outer level right so uh, for the guard for um, The L1 guard right uh, test some but not all um, Or sorry the the outer guard The outer guard for seeing if if um if this is um is this non-zero right? If this is non-zero, some unit test code is expected to be running right. So that our outer guard kind of makes sense right here. Um, so that if other people are using the library, they're not like wondering why the unit test code doesn't run at all. Now, it's not a perfect solution because as we um, get more granular with turning off certain unit test functions, we're actually going to do that inside of the unit test code. And, but we might as well, yeah, I think it makes the most sense here. Um, maybe I'm wrong, right? Um, but let's not worry about splitting hairs, right? Uh, if we think too long about this, then, um, but, well, there's a saying, right, that the, uh, the correct answer too late is the wrong answer, so let's not do that to ourselves by thinking this too, too much through, right? So right here, we're just going to say, you know, if, um, if, and we're going to say, I believe we gave this a namespace, right? So like, um, oh, I see. So this is, uh, so what did we do in the, uh, other library in silence? How do we do that? I leave in the silence functions. We must be like initializing. So let's look at silence uh, dot f for a second, or not silence dot f. Um, that's wrong. No, the instance is right here. AAC twenty twenty silence, but it's not called silence anymore because we're in kill test. So we're gonna rename this to kill test. Kill test. And then this thing right here um, is gonna be named uh, kill test, and um, uh, if zero, no overrides. If that's zero, there's going to be no overrides. AAC main isn't going to exist in this refactored version. Okay. So yeah, a, we're calling it AAC 2020 kill test. So we don't even have to open that up. But yeah, we're going to say if AAC 2020 kill test uh, dot uh, P5D one OGL 
is greater than or equal to 1. Greater than or equal to 1. So it needs to be at least on, right? Any level of on is good enough. Um, you could say that all, like the highest number, is the maximum level of on, right? So we, we spin up the unit test, and the higher and the higher the number is, the more extreme the unit testing is. So we're just going to wrap it like that. Greater than or equal to 1. And if we look at this, we see that it is off, right? So off is uh, defined as 0. So 0 is not greater than or equal to 1, so we're just skipping this stuff now. And the reason we're skipping it is right now it's just, it's just becoming very time consuming. And we'll have to be careful about this because we could shoot ourselves in the foot if we make a horrible mistake and um, don't run any test code for it, and then uh, months pass by before you realize we've been coding on top of a shaky foundation. Uh, so hopefully we don't do that to ourselves. But yeah, so this kind of starts up nice and quick now. There is one more thing, though. We have a, uh, a thing we called, um, what do we call it? We called it faulty kill switch something or other. And that was in not P5D OGL, but it was in the Paint 5D system. So if you go open up the Paint 5D system, the CPU side Paint 5D system, paint5d.functions, and let's also open up the data file. So let's open up the data file for Paint 5D functions. So Paint 5D dot data. We made this thing called like hackish kill switch something or other. Um. Yeah, so we have like a very granular level of control where different systems, we go into the system and turn off unit tests. We made this like unreliable kill switch. So we're gonna go in here and we're gonna find where that is being used, right? So this kill thing. And um, kill is a number where if it's greater than zero, it, it shuts things off, right? So. Uh, which is the same as the current setup I have, right? So now when we shut things off, we um, don't always shut them off. We just kind of like make it unreliably shut off. Now, now that's um. an interesting way to do it. Um, so, we could keep this logic in here like this, so that way, um, if the unit test manager says to turn off the unit test, we still sometimes occasionally run them like with a random 1 in 50 chance. That would be bad for releasing the final code, right? Because then um, the final code sometimes randomly stutters on boot up, and that might not be good. But it kind of prevents us from doing something stupid during development, right? And it's not going to be a long time before we um, figure that out, right? So well, we may kind of see this buried in here, and. and and as time passes by, we might forget about it and have this, like, random, unpredictable behavior. Um, so how are we going to solve that? Well, we could say that, um... So the kill switch... So zero is off, so this kill switch is, is the opposite of what we want. Um, if, um, so let's change this to on, right? So instead of kill, let's say, um, let's remove this kill switch piece of code.
Um, all right, so I removed from Paint 5D data. All right, so we're going to remove this from Paint 5D data. And then this thing here, I think that... Um, I think we just should keep it kind of simple and just say, you know, get rid of this as well, right? So, um... We could also say, you know, uh, removed from paint5d.f. We could make a note about this. Um, a hackish way to shut off tests, but make sure they still run every once and a while randomly. Uh, problem with this, uh, so what's the pro here? Pro, protects us from test rot a little bit. The con, we could accidentally cause random stuttering in people's final games if we forget to shut this behavior off when engine is ready to release. All right, so there's a reason there's, there's a pro and con to this and we can just make a note of that. All right, so we're just going to kind of cut and paste this over here and make a note of the time. And 41, or yeah, 41 minutes, or actually 42 minutes to be cool now. 42.04, and that's not even the time. Uh, this, the video ID is 112. The time is 42 minutes and 20, 23 seconds have out. Yeah, so unreliable kill switch. We're kind of, we're cutting that code out of certain files. So we're gonna remove stuff from paint 5D data and paint 5D functions. And that's this unreliable kill switch code. We're gonna, we're, we're changing that, but we just wanna keep a record, a record of it before we kind of gut it. And what we're gonna do is, so in here, we have this kill thing. We're going to say, we're gonna, remove that case and we're going to take this thing here we're going to go over here we're going to paste this down here and now instead of kill we're going to say on um right so if on is greater than or equal to one and then on so on right here this on marker is going to be set to in kill test data we have AAC 2020 kill test dot, and we're in paint 5 df Paint 5D, uh, it's just paint 5D, right? Just paint 5D, paint 5D. So this thing, we're also gonna turn it off, right? We're gonna implement this as well. And this is um, CPU version of paint 5D, right? So uh, this is the CPU side paint 5D code, and this is the GLSL version of paint 5D code. Uh, the names are kind of confusing because they look much different than each other. Uh, Paint 5D, like P5D, is supposed to be an abbreviation of this, right? Um, it is a little bit weird, but um, I didn't say the code base would be perfect. I have never, ever uh, guaranteed that. And um, perfection is something we should strive to, but we will never attain it, right? It's kind of that weird thing where you know you'll never attain perfection, but if you don't strive towards perfection, then the outcome of what you're building will be even worse than if you weren't striving for perfection. It's just like, it's a weird kind of psychological, like paradoxical kind of thing there. But yeah, we know we can't reach perfection, but we still want to strive towards it. So yeah, so a simpler guard, right? So we're not going to run this uh, public test code unless, um, unless it says that um, this is on, right? So on is anything that's non-zero. Right now it's off. Okay, so let's see if we have that implemented in there and see how, how that's working. It seems that we're, we're getting a little bit faster here where things just kind of spin up nice and quick. And that's good, right? So if we're not 
currently writing unit test code, then we don't want to stunt the speed at which something starts up at. Now, that does mean we need to be careful, right? Because unit tests aren't just there to verify the correctness of the code, they're also there to help protect us from uh, accidentally uh, changing code and making the code erroneous or incorrect, right? So we have our, we've, we've stubbed in unit test code and that, that's good. So now the next thing is, um, the next thing we wanted to do was, I don't know, I don't know what we wanted to do. I'm tired of this. I, I don't really feel like coding right now, but I want to get like a little bit done, right? So we got a little bit done. But at the very least, even if I decide to stop coding right now, I do want to know exactly what to do next, I think, right? Think about, well, think about what to do next, right? Always have what to do next in your brain kind of a thing, right? Um, and then if you think about what to do next, you can think about what to do next after that, and it can kind of like, that can cause like kind of, it can, it can um, feed into itself infinitely. Um, so, but yeah, I, I still would like to know at least what to do next, even if I don't write it. So before this, we were working on some code for the shader code, and um, we had some trouble because the way we wrote our code was not done in a way that's friendly to, friendly to just shoving it in a string. So this fragment shader code here, it's all nice and stuff, except uh, the air string here, if we look at that, we have some places where we use this air macro, and, and where we're using the air macro, we have these hard-coded strings. And that's a problem, because if we want to wrap, um, if we want to wrap uh, this code that we're writing in, in, um, we don't want to wrap this code that we're writing in string in a big string. We cannot um, have strings wrapping this kind of stuff. So we need to um, create some type of macro that stringifies um, these tokens so that we don't have to use this this syntax here. In order to, and then we'd have to do it for this kind of stuff as well. But let's um, let's kind of simplify the problem right now. And let's remove that, right? We'll deal with that when we get to it. And let's just worry about the main problem of just like, um, about these two variables, right? These variables are somehow wrong. Let's not worry about printing them off right now. Let's just worry about how we're gonna deal with these error messages that have quotes. If we wanna put all this stuff into a big quoted string, we can't, we can't do that, right? We can't be using quote characters anywhere, right? Um, so we're also going to nuke this. We're going to nuke this as well. Yeah, which just kind of sucks because it's like, well, what if, what if this comes comes to be an error again, right? Well, oh well, right. Or we we hope not, but right now uh, we really need to just focus on the one problem, right? So anywhere we're using this error macro, we just want the error macro so that it's going to be really easy to wrap this into a string and and uh, get it working. So how do we wrap something into a string, right? Well, we, we have some stuff for that. I, I've done this plenty of times before. Uh, before we do that, let's just make sure that I haven't messed up anything. Okay, so we're still running. So the code still, still compiles, so that's good. So let's talk about how we're going to uh, wrap stuff in a macro that turns things into a string. Um, so I have a thing called uh, glue macro, or uh, glue mac, and that was more than I was thinking that I would get. Um, so you kind of need two, from what I remember, we need two levels of macros in order to stringify something. And Hold on, uh, sh uh, string, uh, sh I think this is what I want, but string if I macro, right? I would like to actually have a very specific, um, 
yeah, so I, I was a little bit... Glue macro isn't what we want. Glue macro is for gluing tokens together. You see how the hashtags here, there's two hashtags. That's for gluing things together. Um, but if we want to string stringify, we just have one hashtag. So that's what I thought. And you notice that we have two levels, right? So if we actually want this to work correctly um, inside another macro, I believe, uh, that is... We have to do it this way. So... <clears throat> let's, um, um, let's just say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say ES private, ES private for airstring private. And then this will just be called ES, right? So airstring, right? Airstring be air ERR for air ERR um, or ERR MS MSG maybe it doesn't really matter too much and then right so this macro takes this air message and then uses this on it right now actually this is too this is too um that is too long so we're just gonna do EM for air message right um so you know air string macro or I guess we use EM for air message, so I don't know if we should say EM here in capitals. But I think error string kind of says, like, kind of implies the implementation. I think it's kind of important to imply implementation when you use it here. So uh, let's take this to the bank and see if we can get this working. So let's go over to where we're defining all this craziness and say, okay, we have these defines for the air. And uh, we're just going to say, you know, uh, define, um, well, we need two defines, right? So let's just go in here, kind of paste this, and these are the new defines that we want, right? And it's not as clean as the other stuff, is it, right? It's like, it's actually quite ugly. So the question is, can we, um, can we put this somewhere else? Well, actually, this could actually execute no matter what because it's going to be, it's always going to be wrapped by this, right? So, and this evaluates nothing, so we could actually define it uh, no matter what. Um, so, we could say, I don't know where we want to put it, but um, I don't know. Always exists air string macro. So we could just put it here and say that, you know, it doesn't have an if def around it. It just always exists, right? So define ES um, for air string. Let me make sure that we haven't used ES anywhere else, right? Because we're saying that, we're now we're saying that we cannot put, use ES anywhere else in the code, right? Which is a, which is a big commitment, right? Um, but we could look at the whole code base really quick and match See, have we even ever used ES everywhere? So if we use match whole word and match case and find all really quick and say, hey, have we ever used ES for something? Uh, no, this is the first time. So we have lots of lot, lot, we have thousands upon thousands of lines of code, and this is the first time we're using a macro called ES. So it's amazing the, you know, 27 letters to, right, 27 Roman letters, but then once you get three letters, what do you got? You got 27 times 27 times 27. Is that um, combinations or permutations? Um, I think that's combinations. Or no, is that permutations? Um, I forgot if that's combinations or permutations. Um, let's think about it. I think it's permutations. Um, I'm pretty sure. So that is. Um, what is that? Um, it's um. It's twenty-seven. Twenty-seven pick three. I think 
right? 27 pick 3. Because so you have 27 things and we have to pick 3 of them. But, the, but there can be, but there can be 27 pick uh, 3, right? Oh, I guess we're not going to be able to do that. Yeah, it's weird how the results will work for choose but not pick. Uh, so 2,000... So this is probably combinations, right? Because the combinations are going to be less because order doesn't matter in a combination, but per in permutations it does. So I'm going to assume that this is uh, this is the permutation calculation where we got three different digits. And um, each digit can be... Uh, uh, one of actually not 27. What am I doing? There are 26 letters in the alphabet. What am I doing here? Uh, but yeah, so 17,000 right so it's weird how you can go from 26 to you know You add two more letters and all of a sudden you have like 17,000 different combinations, right? So yeah, so this has not been used before we're gonna just reserve ES for air string And let's make sure that is that is a macro that makes sense. Like, um, we can also make a note of what that's for, right? Okay, so um, you can make a note here, right? So at vid at vid iid fifty six thirty thirty two. It's not the video ID. I hope that I haven't made that mistake in too many places. Right. So the video ID is 56.50 uh, 50 now. And this macro just exists to help us get rid of quote marks in the source code, right? We want to get rid of, uh, get rid of quote marks in the source. So we can wrap entire thing into a very large multi line string, right? So, so the idea is that we want to we want to use these macros, these ES macros, so that we can wrap error messages without using uh, quotations around them. Now that does mean that the error messages will have to probably have like underscores on them. And so that's going to kind of change kind of how we're doing things. But, um, you know, um, it's better than nothing, right? So we're going to look for where we see the ERR. So ERR, we're going to look for that. And anything where, where we see the usage of ERR, we're going to change it to uh, ES, so air string. So ERR, ES. And the thing that kind of sucks about this is, um, it just kind of sucks, doesn't it? Um, so let's just see if this one line works. Before we change everything, let's see if that correctly compiles. And as long as that correctly compiles, I'm, I'm going to pretty, pretty much assume that that works, right? And the reason I'm going to assume it works is because I've, I've used this macro before. It was in my shortcuts. So I already had high confidence that it works. Um, yeah, so yeah, anywhere we see error, we can just do this now. So let's go look for places where we find ERR and just replace it and just wrap it like this, right? So ERR. So this thing that says ERR, we're going to place it, we're going to remove this and just say error string. And then over here, we're going to remove that. And notice that, you know, it also helps that I write my error messages like this. Because it needs, to, it still needs to be one token like this. So we still have to do this. Otherwise, it's not going to quite work. Um, and so let's keep, keep on going. So anywhere we find ERR, we're just going to go ES. And then over here, we're going to remove the square brackets. Now, I like square brackets to denote that the string is hard-coded. But that's just a convention we're just not going to be able to do here. Um, so that sucks, but... But um, in this case... For what we're trying to achieve, uh, we're just going to have to make that concession. 
So this thing is also going to be ERR ES. Okay, and this is going to also be ERR ES. ES for air string. Okay. Okay, so anywhere that we're using the air message, we also wrap it in ES for air string. And that's so that we want to make absolutely sure there is no double quote marks in this source code anywhere. So absolutely nowhere. Anywhere we see double quotes like this, we have to remove them because it's not going to it's not going to be um, conducive to creating a shader string. So anywhere we've done this kind of nonsense here, we have to uh, we can change things like this. We can uh, highlight things by uh, kind of like putting square brackets around it instead. That could work. So anywhere we see kind of these double quotes, we we'll also should probably look for single quotes, except that it probably doesn't matter. Uh, literally squash for squash amount, right? So we can still emphasize words and kind of annotate them like this with the square brackets. But um, yeah, we don't want any double quotes. It looks like we got rid of all the double quotes. Uh, anywhere I see single quotes, unless it's absolutely necessary, I'm probably going to remove that as well. Actually, you know what? Never mind, because... Um, it's used as a uh, possessive grammatically in my comments, and it's not hurting anything, right? It's the double quote that I need to create the shader string, so it's the double quotes that I really care about sanitizing out of this big shader string. So uh, with that, let's give that a run and see if um, I have made any stupid syntax mistakes. And if I haven't, then the next part is to cut and paste this into the shader string and see if that works. Now, if we get that, um, really that's a kind of a thing for next time though, I think, because now we know it needs to be next. What needs to happen next is we need to cut and paste this into the GLSL shader code and make sure that all of our code magically compiles as GLSL, right? We added a lot of new code and we're hoping that we coded everything in a way that is not going to cause any type of compile time errors, and we're hoping that inside this code, right, this is our main function. We have this macro magicness to make sure that this actually runs as C99 code, right? As sorry, as GLSL code, right? So we got a little macro for constructing um, this output value, right? Because frag color is a float vec4 in GLSL, but there's no such thing as a float vec4 in C99. So we have a polyfill for this type uh, when we're running a C99 code. Um, uh, and then if we're running a C99 code, um, it looks like frag color has to be declared here, right? So if it's running a C99 code, uh, frag col color is a uniform, so it, it just exists. But if it's C99 code, we don't have the concept of uniform, so you have to say, oh, if we're actually, um, uh, if this is not OpenGL code, then it's C99 code. We gotta do, we have to declare it before we can assign it like this. So there's a whole bunch of weird kind of craziness. Uh, if not defined OpenGL, so once again, um, uh, the GLSL code is going to implicitly return this. But uh, if we're running this code as C99 code, once again we're going to have to explicitly return this frag color, right? So a whole bunch of like really weird stuff uh, can sometimes happen here. And we want to just make sure that the new revision of the code uh, works. Now, it is something kind of simple to where we could just find out right now very quickly, right? So we could take this, we could open up the uh, the Paint 5D default shaders, like right here, and we could um, could open this up and right. We made a little stub. Please modify. Blah blah blah. Right. So um, I already made a little little, little to do here, and we could take this code. We could take all this code that we've written, and really hope that since we've made all these changes, everything just magically works, right? Because there's a lot of code here. The idea is that we're hoping that if we adhere to a certain level of standards and always if we adhere to certain standards of writing our code and we always use these macros we've designed 
that if we do all of that, that this code will just always magically compile in GLSL if it passes, if it gets past the C99 compiler, it should be able to get past the GLSL compiler. And also, I realized that um, uh, this ES macro needs to be undefined, right? So um, let's let's um, clean this up again. I was I thought I was we were ready to cut and paste this, but actually, we need to take this, and it looks like it's going to be right. Um, uh, a GLSL global file scope stuff and maybe type macros. So let's go look for where type macros are. And say this is where type macros are. And type macros are. I don't remember where the order is. So I guess uh, where we're undefining type macros, I guess we're going to undef. Um, we're going to undef the always exist macros. Right? Always exist error string macros. We're going to go over here like this. We're just going to undef these as well. So undef yes and undef es private, right? So both of these we're going to undef. And I already see something that I don't like here, which is that uh, the spacing here suggests that these macros are not correctly aligned. And I have done it everywhere. And what I mean by not correctly aligned is that if I were to scroll all the way up to where these are defined, uh, they wouldn't have the same vertical alignment. Now the thing is, is that there's so much code in between that you wouldn't notice, but I know because I, I, uh, I so often do this very meticulously that I know that undef and define differ by exactly one letter, and therefore when we change it to an undef, we have to have two spaces between. Um... So why not kind of like seal some things off here, right? So uh, we're done kind of editing this stuff. So this kind of stuff that we're done uh, working on, that we, or at least the stuff that we think we're done working on a while, for a while, we can kind of like seal that off, right? So the idea is that once it's pasted into the shader string, we don't want to actually edit it. This main stuff, we're going to work on main some more. Um... And we're really not confident about a lot of this new code yet, right? So the stuff that has kind of like marks in front of it, like we gotta scroll way up for that. But this stuff is stuff we're already confident about that we're done editing it, that that it is, it's like the code is solid, that it is, um, the algorithm is kind of complete, I guess you could say, right? Um, so the data structure is never going to change. The, the problem that we're kind of trying to solve in this shader code is never going to change. So a lot of this code, once it's written correctly, we will never, ever, ever go back to it. But, uh, but yeah, so let's take all of this and we know it's going to be like everything here. Yeah, so this is a big chunk of code, right? And there's a lot of potential for something to have gone wrong. We've done our best to kind of hopefully mitigate anything that could go wrong or anything that might compile improperly, but we'll see what happens, right? So so we, th we know this is proper C99 code, but what we don't know right now, one, two, three, we do not know if this is going to be proper GLSL code. We're banking on it. And um, we already have a problem here. And it looks like this is the only offensive thing that the Covey picks thing is out of bounds in terms of um, the code length is way too long. So we're going to have to fix that, right? And it's going to have to get ugly. But the thing is, is it's just going to be a lot easier for me to manually do this hackish kind of process if everything adheres to those column limits, right? And... It looks like it's only that Covey picks thing that's doing it, right? That Covey picks define. Like everything else is like nice. Or we can kind of go backslash n, quote it. But then if we go, uh, if we go all the way up here, we're gonna see that we kind of killed, we killed one of our lines, right? We uh, by doing that, right? We we killed this. Now it's Covey poo whatever the heck, right? So we have to go find this in the original piece of code, right? And we gotta figure out how we're gonna change this. Um, because it's, it's, this line is too long. And we have to think about, well, how are we going to make it shorter, right? So, um,
we could just call it cov, right, for canvas user view, and then it's kind of implied that it's a canvas user view pixel. Um, or we could figure out, um, or you could just change the namespace on this thing, right? We could change the namespace on this and say this namespace is out of hand, right? Because we got we got three namespaces here, right? Really, we should only have two namespaces, right? So if we if we if we chop down that namespace to something more reasonable, then we could we could fix this problem pretty quick. So I think that's the solution I want to go with, um, and that's where things kind of turn into more of an art than than a science because it's like I have this, I have this exact column limit, limit that I want to adhere to, and sometimes the code doesn't want to adhere to that column limit, and so we have to get kind of artful in terms of how we're going to solve problems. But yeah, so anywhere we see this thing here, um, this struct. Let, well, first of all, let's look for this struct, right? So let's look for everywhere this is, and decide what the proper namespace for this is, right? So let's open up this, and we see, okay, OpenGL hack code, and. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, um, does it really belong on this thing called hack code, or is it really something else? I don't know. Um, does it feel like it belongs in like P5D OGLF, not in this thing called hack code? Um, so... We're actually... Yeah, here's the struct right here. So this struct, okay, I see. It is um, it exists only in the shader code. However, uh, this namespace is the shader code namespace. So. So let's look for the, everywhere where this appears again, right? So find and files, find all. And we see um, right here it appears. And this, I assume, is like unit test code. Yeah, this is like unit test code, right? Okay, so what we're going to do is, first of all, before we even refactor anything, we want to make absolutely sure we haven't messed up anything to begin with, right? We don't want two errors compounded on top of each other, so we absolutely want to make sure that it compiles. And as long as it still compiles, then I'm satisfied with uh, refactoring this, right? So we're going to take this type, this type here, and we're going to call it um, AAC2020. And then we're going to call it P5D1OGL CoveyPix. So this is saying that this is this is the GLSL version of Paint 5D, right? This is the GLSL version of Paint 5D namespace. So if we see this namespace appear in CPU side code and GPU side code, that should not kind of um, phase us. That shouldn't be confusing to us. So, right, and then we've saved, we've saved seven letters, we've made this all shorter. So P5D1OGL, and find in, uh, find in files. So we want to find all, and, uh, you know what, I want to do this manually, because I'm kind of paranoid, so I'm going to take this, and we're just going to start replacing, right? So we're going to say replace, uh, replace, replace, so we've actually changed the, so here in the shader code, the fragment shader code, that's where the struct was actually defined. And then over here we have uh, three more hits, so let's go over in here. And same thing, let's kind of replace things. So this thing here, uh, replace, uh, replace, replace, so nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. This is in the unit test code, which is going to reference that shader code, right? It's going to test the GLSL shader code as if it were C99 to help verify correctness. And then in here, it's just some type of comment. So we're going to replace this and then change the indentation a little bit. 
And then we're going to close this and change the language, make sure that uh, it still looks good. Okay, cool. So we did that little refactor. We want to make sure that everything still works, that we didn't do anything stupid. Like, there's no such thing as a trivial refactor. We could have missed something somewhere, right? So we're going to run it. Looks good. Still running. Excellent. Okay, so now that we have that done, we can go back into uh, the fragment shader code. So let's close this. Let's close that. Let's keep this open because this is where we're going to paste to. We can close this code here. So this is the fragment shader code. And it's the Kuvipix thing that was annoying us, right? This was the thing that's going outside of the border. But now we're well inside the border. We have this many extra characters to deal with. So yeah, now we are inside the border. All right, so all the code now is, is small enough or thin enough on the x-axis to where we can just take this. And we still should probably make an automated system for this because... If, if we end up having to do this quite often, uh, this this can become very time-consuming, right? Because we've got to paste it. Uh, but the idea we're hoping, what we're hoping here, is that we have a system to where, once we're ready to paste this code in here, we already have... We have high certainty that this code is going to run or compile correctly, right? Um, the problem, the problem was really going to arise, like, this is not too much trouble to do. Like, it's still very hackish and, and a little bit time consuming, but it's not unreasonable for me, I don't think. As long as we have a guarantee that once we paste this in here, it's going to compile correctly. Now, if we don't have that guarantee, um, if that guarantee seems, to be, if we seem to lose that guarantee, and, and we can't get that guarantee back, then this is just going to be a bad, bad, bad idea. But we're hoping that um, that we can have this guarantee. Now, I don't know if multi-line line comments inside of this will also create some problems, right? Because it has like a, with the multi-line comments, you have a, uh, actually, no, you don't have a backslash in there. But yeah, so we're hoping that there aren't any kind of backslash characters, I think. If you have any kind of backslash characters or things that are going to make this interpret strangely, but yeah, so we're hoping that that uh, this will just, first of all, the first thing we're hoping for is just that this will compile, right? That, that the shader string doesn't have any oddities in it that will make the compiler complain, right? So it looks like that part is okay. Now the next part is the shader code here. We need to reload it. And in order to reload that shader code, we need to go into the mod folder. And we need to take this uh, fragment shader. So this fragment shader right here, this is a cached version of of the shader code, right? You can see this is a little bit shorter. This is like 387 lines of code. And this next thing that we're pasting is, well, probably more than uh, 300 lines, I would say. So we're gonna, so to re-instantiate the shader and reload a fresh version, a fresh copy from the executable, we have to delete the, um, delete the cache, right? This is kind of a cache. Uh, the idea, the reason why I have this cache is so that it's in a thing called mod folder. So we want to allow people to modify the shader code. Uh, so to allow people to modify the shader code, we say if uh, the copy has already been saved to the hard disk, we don't want to reload it from the executable. And then people are kind of free to edit these uh, shaders as they wish. So let's uh, delete this one. So we're going to delete the uh, first shader for Paint 5D, delete it. And now we're gonna we're gonna rerun this, and we're gonna hope we're gonna cross our fingers, and hope that we don't get a syntax error. That 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 the code still runs. Now we haven't changed how the rendering method works. We're just hoping that all of these sub functions that we threw into the code um, are going to are going to just work, and they don't. So now we have to see where we're making that mistake. So there could be plenty of places where we're making that mistake. And this is going to suck, because now we got to figure out where we're doing this implicit cast from int to uint, and we have a lot of code. So let's try to figure that out. So we got implicit cast from uint to int. Um, so one of the places where that's going to happen, right, with the implicit cast from uh, uint to int is where we're using, like, uh, you see how we have... Um, you have these kind of uint casts of different numbers. Anywhere where we accidentally hard-coded numbers that do not have casts around them, 
that's going to be a problem. And this is usually what the problem is when I do something like this. So we have to kind of look around and see, is there any place where we kind of screw that up? Well, um, this should be okay, because this should be an integer. This u00, is that correct? So u00 should be, if we look at the define, yeah, so that's a uint here, right? So uint. And this math here, so this is a u32 var. We can see u32, right? So that looks good. All the stuff that's sealed off with x's is stuff that we already did. So we're not worried really about, if it's been sealed off like that, we're not really worried about it. We're worried about this new code, right? So if we look at this tile quadrant stuff, these all should be unsigned integers that are 32-bit, right? That's the default state. So we're not worried about these numbers. These numbers should be fine because these are int32s. Um, int32s. But somewhere in here we're doing something where something is not, is like an unsigned value. Uh, if 1 and this and tor ix should be a um, int32. Yeah, this is all int32. We have to find something that has unsigned logic in it, right? It's really where the unsigned logic is that we're getting burned, I'm fairly certain. So int32s, so this has a u32 right here. So that's a so potential mistake right here, u32. And if we look at this code here, well, where are we returning u32s in here? Well, right here we're returning u32s for tile exponent. And these numbers are not uh, valid for for um, how um, how this works in uh, GLSL code. So we need to fix that. <clears throat> and uh, the way we're going to fix this, I think that... Um, so squash here, squash is uh, int32, so that's fine. The squash thing, tile exponent right here, uh, it's an int, so that's fine. It's just this equals here. These equals here uh, that are being returned, or tile exponent, no, tile exponent, sorry, I got this backwards. Squash is an int32, but then we're returning this, right? So we got kind of two problems here. First of all, uh, the squash thing that we're using, um, we have an implicit cast here, so that's that's a problem, right? Uh, now, making it an integer here in this table is actually pretty good, because then we only have to do one kind of casting magic macro over here to get this working. Um, so, yeah, because right now this is actually improper C99 code as well. Or at least I view it as improper C99 code because we're doing an implicit cast, right? This squash thing is an int32, but here we go, just passing it out and Im implicitly converting it to unsigned 32-bit. So let's first of all, let's make sure that unsigned 32-bit is actually what we want, right? Like maybe maybe the use case, are we using it as an unsigned or are we using it as a... a um, how, how are we using it? So, well, let's not look here. So how are we using it here? So this thing here. And so we're using it in two places in here. This function here. And um, is this value unsigned or not? That's what we want to know. So this value is squash amount is int32 here. Okay. And how about in the other place where we're using this macro, right? We use this macro in one other place. And it's still a squash amount, huh? Or is it not? Or is it just where we undefine it, right? Um, so this thing here, we define it on 882. 882, yeah. So we only use it there. We only use it there, and it seems to me that in terms of how we actually use it, uh, we actually need it as a int32, right? That's how we're using it. Now, it maybe it doesn't need to be ever negative, but in the case of making this code work nicely and make it work easily, uh, making this an int32 is going to uh, make our lives a lot easier, right? Um, now, we're actually looking at the wrong code, though. This is the fragment shader code. We want to look at the, the origin of this code, right? We want to look at where that comes from, right? So that code comes from over here. That's why I was confused. That code comes from over here. It's looking at the wrong code. 
And we just want to change this to int32 because everywhere we see the use, use case of this code, it's an int32. And that's going to make that so that we don't have any implicit uh, conversions here because now um, this table here uh, will work correctly. And it wasn't that, it was this over here, but now we don't have to worry about that. Now the next place we might want to worry about is, well, okay, what's next, right? Have we done that anywhere else? And I'm going to say, I'm going to say, what we're going to say is, you know what, I think that to line 589, I think we're safe. We still have more code, so um, now this says if not def macro, this is OpenGL. So this, all this stuff is, we don't even have to worry about it because it's not even going to be compiled if it's, if this is uh, OpenGL, right? So this is the next thing that we have to concern ourselves with, and we see that there's a uint32 here. So the next thing is, uh, this is bits. We see kuvi picks to kuvi bits get, so I'm absolutely certain that we need this to be a uint32. Uh, so we have these different bits. We made sure to use this, right, to initialize this because of the implicit type conversions. But I know in other places we probably screwed up. So this thing, uh, how about this thing? So we have math and whatnot. Um, tile exponent. Um, so are these both unsigned? Do we make sure to make, or not unsigned, but are these both signed types? So are these types, yeah, so they're both, those are both signed. Uh, the tile value, however, tile value, we're expecting that to be unsigned, right? Tile value should be like a, a bit value, right? So if we look at bit value, we see, oh, indeed, we have a U32 for that, so that's good. Uh, we have an assert, and the tile value is less than or equal to 4 minus 1. Well, guess what? This assert is going to fail us. Well, guess what? We don't have the, the assert only exists when it's C99 code. So even though we have this kind of implicit cast between uh, signed and unsigned, that's fine because the assert won't uh, won't complain. It won't exist in the GLSL code. Uh, so covbits is covbits. I mean, do we make any mistake with covbits? Is covbits uh, unsigned value? And it is. We'll use this macro to make sure we don't have any implicit type conversions. Um, and so the shifting amount. Uh, these are both integers, so that's fine. So that logic looks good to me. Okay, and this function hasn't changed at all. So yeah, we, we think that we think that we gave it a once over and we think we found the major mistake. So we're gonna compile this one more time. And we're just compiling it to make sure that there's no mistakes, right? That there's no like actual syntax mistakes in this. And if there's no syntax mistakes in this, then we can go into the mod folder. We can take this fragment shader code, we can delete it out of here so that it's going to be reinstantiated when we uh, uh, turn this on. The thing is, is that before we do that, we have to take all this code that we... See, this is the problem. This is the problem with our workflow here, is that we now we have to take all this code here, we have to copy it to the clipboard, right? So we think we fixed it, and we have to copy it to the clipboard because it compiled correctly. It compiled correctly, so we think it's correct uh, after we made those little changes. And now we have to take all this code here, we have to go over here and we have to paste it, and then we have to, like, this is annoying, right? This is like, you know, this is, this is tedious. Now, like I said, if, if, as long as we don't keep on making mistakes like that, that are costly, then I'm okay with this. Because I think that this workflow, this workflow completely sucks, but it also uh, makes the code very easy to follow. Um, so it's like, um... It's like, uh, if we don't want a really complicated build system, this is the way we're going to have to do it. And I would like not to have a complicated build system. So we'll have to, we might have to reevaluate our life choices in terms of no complicated build system. But uh, for, for now, it looks like we're gonna, just going to slide by on this. So, okay, so now we've pasted the new code in here. We're hoping we're not going to get that uint whatever the heck problem. Because the problem is, is that if we get that problem, we kind of don't know exactly what line it's on, right? Um, because we kind of might be able to, because we only have these two extra lines in the string. So everything is going to be like offset by two, right? From this stuff, right? So, so we might be, so it's, so everything's nicely organized to where, since we've consolidated most of the code into this master payload here, 
um, the line number actually might give us some information so that we can find out exactly where the problem is happening, right? We just have to say, um, um, yeah, we just have to, it's, it's, uh, the line number is pretty close to where the actual problem is happening, but not exactly, right? So let's, so syntax error, so what's the problem now? Uh, implicit cast from int to uint, right? And so, um, so we have like, um, so we have 0, 982. I don't know if 982 is actually going to be like a line number. I actually think that would be like a column number, but let's look at 982, because I'm going to assume that 0 doesn't really make much sense, but... If we look at 982 and look around it, maybe we can find a problem. So it, we would expect it to be kind of near the bottom because it's going to be some new code we added. And so 982 over here. So that is kind of like in a place near where we think we may have like made a mistake. Now, um, with 982... Um, so if we're looking at this, and we think this is line, so what's the transformation here? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So I think this is line 11, but it's actually line 3, right? So we have to take the line number and we got a minus 8, right? We have to take the line number and minus 8 to get the line number that, um, the compiler line number, right? So this this line number, minus 8, um, is the same thing as minus 7. Minus 7, we get 3. And line number 3 is what it is. So we got to take 8 and minus it um, to get the actual line number, right? So if we go... So if we want to know this actual line number, this 982, we got a minus eight to know what it is in the compiler. So that means that if if we want to get the if we want to get the compiler number from here, so this is the text number, a source code number. If we want to get the compile the compiled code number, we got to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, but that doesn't make sense because I thought these asserts would vanish. Um, should vanish. If, um, I was pretty sure these asserts would vanish if, uh, would vanish covbits. Is covbits the correct type? U32? I thought these asserts would vanish if, if, uh, it's GLSL code. And maybe I'm wrong here because if you look at this bin, right, we have a bin macro for this. And so that all works. Uh, and this assert would be it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, maybe it's the assert that's getting us because this assert is technically, um, it should be compiled out. It should be compiled out, but if it were somehow not compiled out for some weirdness that I cannot explain, if it were not compiled out, then yeah, this this comparison would be wrong because we need we need to say um, okay so four minus one um, so we just want to say that's three right so it's a uint three right tile value is a uint three right so we so if we want to fix this if we really think that's what the problem is and and I don't know if that is what the problem is and that's why this is kind of hackish. But if we think that's what the problem is, we have kind of these uint values here. We could say, um, you know, define uh, u uh, so uint three. So u o three is for a uint three. B three is for is is a bit mask of three, right? Um, so there is a reason for why I'm going to make this, right? So we are thinking that that is the problem. 
and this is kind of, yeah, this is kind of horrible in sense of the, the time commitment here. Uh, this guest check. But it'd be even worse, The this workflow would be even worse if we tried to do it without this system in place. Because I don't really have a good GLSL kind of workflow, I guess. So U03 right here. So this is, so for U03, it's going to be... Um, as a constant, right? So, uh, sure, as three and um, three as a uint is like this, but then in C99 code we can just make it this, and that'll be fine, right? Uh, or we could make it like this, right? So we could just make it this, since it's not like a That's actually kind of easier to read than this. So yeah, we could make that. And then... That also means that this checksum is wrong, right? Because now we have 15 things. So we can go down and we can find... Um, we want to find where we have... Uh, B3, and above B3, we want to put U03, right? So above B3, we want to put U03. So undef. So above B3, we're going to go undef U03. And yeah, I don't... I'm hoping that we'll figure out what stupid mistake I'm making. But it just sucks that... My workflow for this is 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 less than optimal would be an understatement, right? Um, okay, so we got this kind of U03 thing, this Uint3, and it's number 10, right? It's number 10, yep. Um, and we have it as a proper Uint constructor in here. And now the thing is we actually have to use it, right? So. We were thinking that uh, we have it bookmarked as to that assert statement that we're thinking is giving us a headache, or I guess we don't. Um, it's on 900 and something, right? So we have some type of assert statement for the, right, the tile value uh, assert statements. And this tile value, also this tile value, oh, hold on. So that's a problem, unless we're inside of, oh, we're inside of, um, the uh, OpenGL only code, so that's fine. Um, but over here, we are, what we're thinking here is that we're doing an assert on the tile value. We're thinking that um, we need to say, instead of saying uh, 4 minus 1, we say U03. AKA uint four minus one. So we're thinking that uh, that this is we need this assert, right? So four minus one is going to be three. We're thinking that maybe this comparison is somehow doing something weird, which doesn't make sense to me. So I feel like we're we still may get in trouble here. Uh, the other line where it might be happening is is the line above, right? This tile value thing, where we have this OpenGL paint five D get. And if we look at all these parameters, are they all supposed to be parameters that are int32? And if they are all parameters that are supposed to be int32, and it takes a and it returns a u32, the TV is a u32. But are any of these inputs not um, not the correct type? Are any of these are any of these at all? Is there anything here that is not? A, uh, un a signed 32-bit integer, right? So any of these colors, if anywhere we see where they're declared, we see something that's not int32, then we can say, oh, that's a problem. So Ladex in this, these inputs here, uh, we want to make sure that those are int32s. We can see that, yeah, when they're brought into the function, those are also int32s. So that all looks good, right? So that doesn't look like a problem. Okay, so now the next thing is to just be like, I don't know what's going on. Covbits, covbits. Do we make a mistake with covbits? Covbits is a bit mask 
Should be U32. Does this function return U32? Yes, it does return U32, so that's not a mistake. Uh, bit shifting and packing, that should be with unsigned values. This is the unsigned value here. This is the unsigned value here, so that should all work. So now we're going to make sure we haven't done any syntax mistakes. And then we're going to we're gonna give it another shot, right? We're going to see if we can... Okay, so that, um, that compiles. Now the next thing is, let's just try to cut paste this and see if we've made a mistake somewhere else. Or if we fixed that one. I think we have fixed at least one of these mistakes, but I, I fear that there may be more stupid mistakes somewhere in this code that I don't know about. Um, so we're just going to keep on keeping on until we can figure out what we're doing wrong. And we might actually want to start, um, I don't know, like getting in here and kind of hacking directly in, in this shader string until we locate where the problem is, because this is just, this is just horrible. This, this sucks. This sucks. But at least it's like, I don't really feel like coding anyways, so if I don't feel like coding, I guess this kind of time-consuming, kind of mindlessness kind of thing that it's going to take some time to do anyways. So it, so I guess the best time to do this, the best time to do this kind of stuff is when I'm not being enthusiastic, right? Because it's like, when I don't have, right, when my brain isn't going burr, right, and computing stuff really fast, then it kind of makes sense to... Um, do the mundane stuff, right? Like, a lot of times, like, if I don't feel very productive, I'll do, like, mundane tasks, like wash dishes, right? Where it's it doesn't take much computing power, but if you're not sleeping, but your brain doesn't want to work, I guess, well, what else can you do that... What's the most productive thing you can do for your situation, right? So let's go into the mod folder. Let's once again delete this... Uh, shader and let's build this again and see if we still get that syntax error and we really need um, if we could get like some better error message like like we really want well never mind so that is actually quite shocking right so what we discovered here was that we just discovered that for some reason the assert code even though it gets, even though it gets, um, the macro logic removes it, the assert code somehow still has to be written properly, and that's kind of weird. But yeah, let's go into the mod folder really quick and look at that. So we're gonna look at what we what is. So this is actually the shader code string that got executed, and right. So the the thing we, the only thing we changed was we added that U O three. Right, we added an unsigned. Uh, we used U O three somewhere. Instead of the, um, so we use this U03 here, right? So originally it was 4 minus 1 to get 3, and uh, we were like, oh, this comparison for some reason is failing. Now this assert, there's no such thing as assert in uh, GLSL code, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, like we can go up to the top of this GLSL code and see, um, you know, if it's open GL, this assert function gets optimized out, right? It gets turned into nothing. But it seems that even though it gets turned into nothing, it still needs to be a properly formatted expression uh, when it's passed into the macro. That that I did not expect. Um, that's good to know about, and it's good to know about. I hope I don't forget about that. But yeah, I I did not realize that. Um, so now the cool thing is, is uh, we have the all the code we worked on and all the code we tested now. Uh, is working, right? So, right, so we write all of this code. All this code we wrote is C99 code, right? So we wrote like a, a big, hold on. We wrote a big chunk of like, you know, a thousand lines of, uh, a thousand lines of C99 code that can also run as GLSL, right? And we can run our unit tests on it. And then in the, the ideas, we can just cut paste it into our shader string and then it'll just work, right? And we had some hitches getting that to work, but we did add a lot of code, so, you know, that's kind of be, to be expected, I guess. So then now the next question is, uh, what, can we start writing the actual shader logic now? Do we have enough to, enough, do we have enough stuff here to start writing the actual shader logic? And also, before we do that, 
we made small little changes, and we we probably want to make sure that those small little changes were not detrimental to the code, right? So if we go into, let's close this, uh, no. And if we open up, um, so we're going to open up kill test, right? And um, we, we, we wanted to say that if kill test, if kill test right here was, um, was one, everything would be on, right? Test everything. One, all tests are on. So let's uh, implement this all tests are on thing, right? We didn't quite implement that correctly. Let's do that right now because we actually want to use an override to turn on all the tests. So in paint 5D functions, um, It's UTC, unit test code usually, I call it. Um, so paint 5D unit test. Um, let's do paint 5D init, because I think that's going to get us closer to where I want to be. So inside of paint 5D init, we have some crazy stuff, and then we have a private init function, and then inside the private init function, somewhere, we're calling the test code, right? And we had like a wrapper for that somewhere, didn't we? Or I thought Paint 5D and it had like some wrapper around some of the test code or... Or was it another piece of like code? I don't know. Oh, here it is. Here's that code we wrote. So unit test if never ran before and if on is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, or, or, um, AAC 2020 kill test dot kill test, um, right, all tests are, uh, so we're going to say or greater than or equal to zero, uh, greater than or equal to one, right? So, uh, we're saying, you know, if it's on, or if the override, right? Um, so, if it's on or the override is turned on, then we're going to run this code, right? And we want to do the same thing in P5D OGLF, right? So here, we're going to say uh, kill test. Right, we already know we implemented this, so this is probably what I should have looked for the first time. Um, so this thing here, we can say um, define uh, P5D AC2020 kill test dot P5D P5D1 OGL in define uh, uh, really, it's like an override. Okay, I'm going to do it like this, even though it's kind of like a little bit ugly. I think that calling it override kind of makes sense. AAC 2020 kill test dot kill test. All right, so that's the override, right? And, right, so EV, P5D, and override. And I actually like it aligned kind of like this, I think. Yeah, so we get some room here. So if if the paint P five D test is turned on or uh, override is greater than or equal to one, right? So if the override is turned on, then it overrides, right? So P5D is turned on, or the override is turned on. If either one of those is true, then we're, then we're doing it. 
Um, so we also want to like, um, we also want to override switch for turning things off. So how would we do that? So, um, so to turn everything off, right? So to override stuff to turn everything off. Um, So if the if the killing override, right? So uh, negative one is all tests off, right? So if the killing override is not then set, then um, let's write it simpler. Let's write it simpler for a second. So let's write it more dead simple. If override, so if um. If override is a negative, right? If you have negative one for the override, else if override is greater than or equal to, right? So so let's just write it dead simple, right? So rather than try to con combine these conditions, um, it would make more sense to say like um, do this, right? So that way, and we're gonna have to duplicate some code to do this. But the code is going to be more dead simple to follow, right? So because now we can say like, um, so if it's greater than or equal to one, right? If these tests are on, then we're we're going to run this. However, um. Um, override all tests off, and then over here, we're just going to duplicate this, right? And, and the reason we're going to write it this way, instead of, like, add weird conditions, is because it's just, it's more dead simple, right? So there is code duplication, but we've made the code more dead simple in terms of being able to understand what's going on, right? So, uh, if override is... Negative, it means uh, all tests are off, so we do nothing. We can also make a note of this, right? So, uh, at vid iid, and the time is 1 hour, 52 minutes, and 30 seconds. We can make, and we can kind of explain what we're doing here for the camera again. Uh, so we've written this code in a dead simple way, where we're kind of duplicating this code and this code right here, uh, because we just want to make it very easy to understand. So if the override is negative, it means that it, it shuts off all tests for all systems, so we do nothing. If the override is a positive one, then we always run the code. And if override is, um, if override zero, right, if override zero, then, um, we only care about, then we just care about this, right? So, uh, we, if, if we're not looking at an override, right? Um, if the override is just zero, it has no behavior, right? So zero has no override behavior, right? So if it's negative, it has a behavior. If it's positive, it has a behavior. Otherwise, we defer to the p, to the kill test.p5d1ogl, right? Because that's the namespace we're in. We say, hey, are you supposed to be running unit tests? And if you're greater than zero, um, then yes, you're gonna run your unit test, right? So uh, it is a bit, bit verbose, but the idea here is that we've written it in a way where um, where it's very easy to follow. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And so that's the way we want to stick to it. It's just a very easy way to follow the code, even if it means writing things in kind of a more verbose, kind of annoying way. So this P5D we're gonna get rid of. We're gonna keep the over. We're gonna keep this as named as override because I think it's easier to read as calling this override because we might want to. This might be confusing. Um, and we'll get rid of this. So we got extern void and override for our, our uh, macros here. And then if we're lucky, 
we can just seal this back off like like it was, I think. I think it was sealed off kind of like this. Why I did that, I don't know why, but I like it, so we'll keep on doing that. And uh, this is for Paint 5D OGL, and we also want to do it for the other test code. But we just want to make sure that, you know, as we have been making those modifications, kill test, uh, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's not called uh, 2200. Where did we do that? That is... Um, Is that in a different file? Uh, Paint5d.f, we made a mistake there. Let's go look at Paint5d.f. Yeah, so this is wrong, right? So this is AAC, this should be 2020. And also, let's look at this. So this is the other code that we wanted to wrap with some stuff. And we're kind of saying if on or if kill test, whatever the heck, right? So, um, so, Do you want to do the same thing of like, um, I still like the idea of calling it override. Um, so, you know, calling it like define override, right? We can call this override and we can call it AAC 2020 kill test dot kill test. Right, this is that's the override, and then and then we can do that. We can implement uh, this as well, right? So we can say that um down here override. We want to undef override. Actually, we want to undef override over here. This is well, this one's on, right? So this is on, And we may change our mind with what these macros should be, but override on EU, etc., whatever. And if override less than or equal to zero minus one, right? So if it's the negative, else if override greater than or equal to uh, zero plus one, if it's positive. Positive is the always on override. Negative is the always off override. Else, if the override has, if there's no override behavior, then we don't do anything, right? So, uh, override behavior never test anything. All tests off, right? And this one is all tests on. All tests off. So override <clears throat> Alright, so this is override all on. Can we get that? Kind of in there, maybe. If we smash it in there, we can. Override all on. Override all off. Or, sorry. All, this is all, all on. This is all off over here. My bad. So we have override all off and override all on. And this one. And so right here is a uh, do nothing. And this is the override section, where we're going to always execute. Otherwise, we need to make sure that it's on. And uh, this this other thing here, we kind of interlaced it a bit because we wrote a little bit more confusing. But I think it makes more sense to write it this way. And we can say, you know, right, um, so, yeah. Uh, do you want to just keep this macro anyways here? Because it can't, it, cause even though we're not using it here, we could, it could give us some information as to what this means, right? On. Right, that's what it means. It means on. Um, let's use on with two ends just so that we can kind of see it in the other places in the code. Sure. 
Uh, so is it on, right? So is it overrided to always be on? And if none of the overrides apply, then we look specifically at this, right? So the thing we can do there that kind of makes that nice is now um, instead of instead of editing this where we have both these turned off, right? We can do the we can do the big kind of thing and say, hey, you know what? Um, uh, right now we're kind of worried that somewhere we might have broken something. So let's do like a mega test where we tr we want to flag everything on right now. We don't want to individually go through all these flags because maybe we like the configuration settings in here about what's on and what's off. But we just right now for a quick second, we want to test everything, right? So that's kind of why I designed it like that. So now let's give this a run and hope none of those unit tests fail, right? We just want to make sure the unit tests all, all pass because we made some minor edits to the syntax and, you know, we don't think we did anything catastrophic, but um, it, this gives us sanity, right? So there's a lot of things unit tests do, right? Obvi the obvious thing is it verifies correctness. It also protects against accidental changes. And then I guess kind of a derived third thing is it gives us sanity, right? Because once this runs, like I'm pretty sure I didn't make any changes to the code, but we're kind of messing in there a bit, right? We're changing little tiny things that should not matter, but we absolutely need to make absolutely sure that it's still working, right? Um, and, okay, cool. So it looks like that worked to me. Um, now, okay, so the other problem here, so this is stalling because it's lazily invoking the um, some other tests now, right? Uh, the Paint 5D system itself uh, lazily invokes its test, which I really need to change that up, but that that's what that stall is for. Um, I mean, it's not too bad of a problem because I, I know what it is, and if we have unit tests turned off, then we don't even have to worry about it, but that, that kind of sucks. But the thing is, it didn't crash, so that means that all the unit tests passed. Um, all the unit tests passed, and we kind of like got that in there, right? So now we can turn the tests back off, like uh, this uh, override. We can turn that override that turns all the tests on. We can turn that back off uh, because we are, we're certain that it works. We know the shader code works. So the next thing is we have to think about in the fragment shader code here, we got to think about how, what are we going to write in the body of this shader to start fleshing out some type of workable like shader code here right so we're, we're kind of at the point where we can start kind of doing this but before we do that what i think would be nice is we know that all this stuff works and it all passes its tests and so if you remember earlier when we pasted this code into the shader to figure out if it worked or not um we when we're trying to figure out what lines were causing problems, we immediately ignored any of these lines that had these X's in front of it because these are kind of like sealed areas where we know that we already we already looked at it, we already compiled it here to this point and everything was working, right? So if we can do kind of something similar where we kind of um if we can do that to the rest of this code where we can kind of like start sectioning it off then we can have a little bit more sanity of mind, right? Like when we're looking at it, and this is also one of those tedious things that is kind of mindless. And like I said, I didn't feel very motivated. So if we can do more of this tedious, mindless stuff where I don't feel motivated right over here, then I think that's going to uh, help me get some stuff done that I think it would be helpful to be done but it doesn't really, it's, 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 it's busy work, right? It's, it's mindless busy work. So why not do it? Why not do it right now? Because it's mindless busy work, right? Um, so for some of this stuff, right, we're kind of like, we're not, we can't be perfect about it. Some of this stuff is, right, we have a very restricted column limit here, right? Because we're restricting to, we're restricted to 64, but then we restrict ourselves down to 60 here. And then this is what? This is how many is this? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Um, so five more. So down to sixty, down to fifty-five. We're we're reducing ourselves to fifty-five column limit when we do this. 
So, that's fine. We can do that. But we just have to... Um, as we're doing that, uh, we got to be aware of what we're doing, I guess, right? we got to... Um, so this right here, right? So we can do this and say... Right? And we can just kind of keep on blocking this stuff off, right? And just... Um, basically just busy work, right? Just do some busy work so that next time... Um, next time... And this is for define, so this is more like classes, right? So this is S for structs, right? Um, so those previous hashtags were for define, so we could use like S for struct, maybe. If we want to keep some type of thing here. Uh, so canvas user view. Uh... We're just going to remove the pixel whatever. Technically, canvas user view IX and IY, they're not actually pixels anyways, so it might be good to not confuse us. So a lot of times we can think of them as pixels, but they're not pixels. Um, but yeah, just kind of do some busy work over here and just look through this stuff and be like, hey... Is this code done, right? Is this code done? Well, we tested it all. It should be done. Now, I know that eventually we wanted to put, like, lookup tables in some things, and so it's it's not completely done. But the thing is, is for now, for now the code, for the foreseeable future with a lot of this code, it's it's done, right? And, um, so this stuff here, uh, we're gonna have to save some space, so I think if we kind of go in here like that, right, just figure out figure out where we want to save some space and then look at these assert statements and be like oh boy uh, what are we gonna do um, so the easiest way out of this is just to define shorthand versions like right here just be like te tile claw whatever and then we can shorten this but it also makes the code longer but that would be the easiest way out. So let's. That would be the easiest way out without wrecking our formatting. So uh, TQ uh, is still qua, right? Uh, and there's six of this. Two, three, four, five. Actually, no. Did I say six? There's only five. But yeah, we could take all these and we could just paste it like this. And then we can just say TQ, TE, uh, tile layer. And then uh, local TX, local TY, right? So TX, TY. TX and TY. And now the problem with this is it makes the code longer, right? That's the main problem. It makes the code longer. We're going to sac... If we want to get rid of that extra vertical... The extra horizontal space that we're taking up, and we want to get rid of that, we can do it. But the cost to us is that we are gonna have to do this, right? But now we can take all this, right? All this nonsense here. We can just take it and paste it here because we did everything uh, quadrant, exponent, layer, x and y. Yeah, we can take that. And then bam, right? We have we now have enough to where we can do this. Now, the problem with that is that if we're not careful, if we're not careful with what we just did here, like anytime we change a line of code, we're potentially putting a bug into the code, right? Um, even though, even, even though you think, oh, it's just a trivial little line of code, I have done those little trivial lines of code that shouldn't change anything, and they do, and, and disastrous things happen, and it's a bad time. Um, so... So, if we want to be more terse, we can explain everything right here like that. Um, let's get rid of this um, X, Y thing comment. Uh, tile span, tile, uh, let's 
size and pebbles. Really, that's just size and pebbles, right? It's till pub, it's the size of the tile and pebbles. So we're going to keep it like that because I think that is easier to understand. And then pixel offset. Pixel offset quad. Pixel offset uh, quadrant uh, x. Y. Alright, that's what that is, is XY location. <coughs> yeah, so. And you can keep on going through this and kind of try to um, make things more concise, right? So, um, over here, this nonsense. If we could. So sometimes that means that some of these commentaries are going to start looking like complete crap, right? Because um, but one, two, three, four, one, two, ooh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, some of these commentaries are going to start looking kind of like crap. Um, but, yeah. By doing this, it's going to be easier to kind of see. Now, if we do this inside of a multi-line comment, does that create problems for us? Like, we have this multi-line comment that we start here, and then we end it here. Well, this is going to definitely going to register as the end of a multi-line comment. This registers as the start, so I think that should actually be okay. Um, in terms of how it's processed. I could be wrong, but we'll find out, won't we? Um, but let's, um, let's just remove this. And, I don't know. Let's just do, uh, I don't know what we want to do. I guess we could just do this. We could just do stars. Right. Just write it some way where we kind of know. Know where we are, right? Um, so this code, let's kind of keep this to three hashtags like that. To kind of keep that similar pattern. And then can we keep on going, right? This is a if def section, so why not kind of label it like that? Why not close it off in a way where when we're looking at it, we know exactly what's going on, right? Where we can see, oh, we got some hashtags around here. Oh, this must be like an if def for a uh, define section, right? And so this is almost good enough, so we can just kind of get rid of some of that extra padding, and that'll be good enough to close that off. And some of this is like, ooh, so close. Let's just do that so we can do this. Okay. And this is end if. This is if def blah blah blah. So once again, let's keep to that like three hashtag thing because I kind of like how that's working out for us. Um, this is gonna kind of suck. Um, well, we can remove that here, and then we can put this over here. Okay, we're just trying to nickel and dime and see where we can kind of save save space in terms of how we're writing this. And this is, let's just make dashes for that. Um, Tor is out of range. 2021. Tor out of range. Okay, right, we're just gonna rename this error message just so that we have enough room to kind of do this, right? Okay, this nonsense. Uh, can we do the same deal? All right, so move this over here. And I guess we could move that over there like that. And then we're still, we could collapse this. And then we have just enough room, okay. So sometimes my formatting is inconsistent because I, I'm intentionally kind of compressing this just so that I can get this 
in here like that, right? So that's the end if. So this actually needs to be dashes, I think, for the way we were doing this. Ooh, hold on. Are we wrong here? Is this one, two, three, four? Okay, no. One, two, three, four. No, nope, we're good there. Um, okay, this needs to be like that. Oh, this. And then this is, right, we can make this dashes. And this is another if def. And you can go like this. We can just keep on kind of going through here. And painstakingly, um, kind of like doing this. Uh, oh, be. We'll just call it OOB, OOB Poxy, which is kind of a cryptic message, but uh, we have the date on it, right? So um, right now we just want to be able to get this all in here. Um, so this thing we could do, we could get rid of some space here, and we could get rid of some space here, and then we could get rid of the space here. And we're still not good enough. Now, if we do this, we get rid of the color on the zero. That's why I don't want to put it there. Um, what if we do negative zero like that? Yeah, sure, like that. Uh, can you just do this all together? Nope, that won't. Okay, there we go. So that's good enough. And that's a peculiarity of how my syntax highlighting works. So Now, this is already outside of the, the uh, undef, right? So we're going to do that. And then... Uh, literally squash for squash amount. So we can change that like that. I like how that lines up, but literally squash for squash amount. Yeah, but yeah, so we're just going to do this, and, and I know it's kind of tedious and seems kind of stupid, but the idea is that um, if we... If we make sure that this is all good, um, that was just that. Let's let's forget about that. Let's just change that a little bit. Um, I don't know why we got started at that three things in a row. I think it's because of this. Yeah, because of that. Um, that does change things a bit, doesn't it? It's not the same level of indentation. Hold on. No, it's the same level of indentation. That's why we did it. Okay. Um, this is a trap value. Let's just get rid of the notation for a trap value. That's the whole point. Um, if we get rid of the notation that says it's a trap value, then we have enough room to just put that in there. Now, this is a if crash on vital to do. So this is a um, macro section. You can seal it off like that. Uh, to do rewrite as lookup table. Uh, once we have final, yeah. So that is true. Um, we can kind of so right. So we're gonna change the way we wrote that comment so we have a little bit more room. And then we can just go like this, one, two, three. Um, let's just move that in like that. And uh, this is for not OpenGL. So all this stuff should never run if it's open, if it's uh, not uh, OpenGL code. Uh, I am getting kind of sick of this though. I, I am gonna say like, just kind of like sealing all this stuff off. Uh, main is kind of like where we don't ever want to seal it off because it's going to change a lot. 
But all these other algorithms um, should kind of be like, we're kind of like done writing them. Um, so, we still got a lot of stuff to kind of throw in here and make sure it's so... So let's just make sure everything compiles, make sure we haven't in, uh, injected any stupid kind of syntax yet, right? Like a syntax mistake like this. So, um, right at the beginning somewhere, we already did something stupid. And we're hoping that the only stupid mistakes that we've introduced in the code are kind of like syntax mistakes like this. So on 117, right, or we made all these S's on 117. Expected identifier or whatever the heck. So it's over here. So we got this multi-line thing going on. And I think that uh, we were kind of wondering if the multi-line thing would cause a problem. And maybe it's not causing a problem, but it's the fact that this is star slash, this is star, there's a star star slash right here, right? And so that might actually be the only problem. And if we give it some room, it might actually uh, work again. So how about uh, one, two, three, four, and one, sorry, and uh, one, two, three, four, right? Give it some room. And then kind of sh shuffle some stuff around here, right? And if we, if we do that, I think that that'll actually have gotten rid of the problem for, for this code. I think. I, I don't know. I kind of question whether or not this would work in the first place, but I think that'll work. And yeah, so now we're at 564. We made some more stupid mistakes. And... Yeah, so once again, right, this multi-line comment being right up next against uh, to here is creating problems. So one, two, three, four. So we just kind of do that. One, two, three, four. And now the comments aren't like merged into each other. So this is a thing where uh, we get the compiler, the C99 compiler, to sort out all this nonsense. All, all the Most of the mistakes are going to be caught by the C99 compiler. And then when we cut and paste as GLSL code, usually it'll just work, right? That's the hope, right? So let's keep on doing this and say, like, this is a lot of busy work. But let's try to get all this busy work out of the way so that once we're, once this code is, um, once this code is, um, once we're ready to, Oh, sorry. Wait, no. One, two, three. So what's up with this? Is there an extra... Oh, no, it's because... Um... So this is not the same. This needs more spaces, right? This would be like... Uh, this would support like one digit in the middle. And this right now... We, only, we, we don't need to double digit this though, right? Because... It's just, you know, one and two. One and two, right? So let's just do that. Let's change that around. That checksum didn't need to be like that, right? That checksum did not have to be written that way. One, two, three. Um, and yeah, so we're just going to go through here. We'll just keep on doing this nonsense, right? We're just going to keep on doing this nonsense until everything has been kind of sealed off. I know it is time consuming and it seems kind of like busy work and it is busy work. But like I said, I'm not feeling, feeling very motivated to do anything at all right now. So um, it's actually a great time to do busy work. Um, so this thing here, do we want to figure out how to shorten this down or what do we want to do here? So we have p5d tor dot whatever the heck, uh, core logic of function, uh, ladex, So what is P5D Tor? P5D Tor, uh, tile origin. How about how about just calling it Tor IX, right? So what if we go we'll go over here and we go uh, define uh, Tor 
IX. And that's going to be P5D Tor dot loc TX, right? And then we can define uh, Tor IY as P5D P5D Tor dot loc TY, right? So you can take these and say P5D Tor. We can make sure that these are all the same colors here for a second, right? Or, um, hold on. So the commonality will be like a purple. And then we'll have the cyan and the orange, right? And we'll just make sure that all that looks correct and then make the cyan and orange. And then uh, right here, we're just going to replace things, right? So we're going to take these cyan and oranges and we're going to just say over here, we're going to replace with a macro. We're going to replace this with the macro too. We're going to replace this with the same macro. We're just going to use these macros to shorten, shorten up this nonsense over here, right? And then down here, we're going to do our undef, right? So we're going to take this and we're going to undef space space tor ix and then we're gonna undef tor i y right and if we do that then then everything is kind of is more compact and we can fit this all in now the thing is is that is kind of a um a serious change i think where it kind of merits hey let's start this up make sure it still works and then after it still works we want to let me check what the heck this is Oh, Franker face. Okay. So make sure it still compiles. And then after it still compiles, the other major concern is, well, um, let's not worry about if it if it can paste a GLSL code. Like, we're pretty sure that we're not making any changes that'll affect that. But what we do want to do is we do want to put our tests back on. We're going to turn all the tests back on for a second here. And we want to rerun this, right? And this is going to take a while. But I do want to be really paranoid that this should only be a cosmetic change, but even though there's no such thing as a trivial refactor, right? So, like, even though this seems trivial, there's always the potential to, if you're making physical changes to the code, right, you're changing, you're changing the code in any way, there's the potential to break something. Like, even changing just comments, really, because uh, the comments, right, if you've ever seen the Java example where you can, like, put executable code inside of a comment. Well, you can do something similar in C code. Uh, it's not quite similar. I think it just causes a syntax mistake, but like if you use like a backslash in a, a comment section, if you use a backslash somewhere inside a multi-line comment, um, yeah, the, uh, the C99 compiler does not like that. So anyways, now this is going to stall, right? We So we have some lazily invoked unit tests that are going to happen when we move to the first editor. So this is going to stall really quick. So once we go over to the next editor, we're going to see some stalling. So this is going to pause. Okay, so it's pause. It's stalling on us. Don't worry about it. It's just stalling. It's, it's thinking. It's thinking really hard. It's running those unit tests. And that's why I want to be able to turn these unit tests off, because it's it takes a long time, and also, it'd be horrible if someone had their game, and then their game kind of just stalled on startup like this, right? That'd be horrible, right? But yeah, so we can see that um, the test passed. Now, we don't know if the shader code is still valid, because we're using the cached shader code. We haven't copied and pasted this over into the shader string, but uh, I'm fairly confident it will work once we paste it into the shader string. But we just want to kind of start, keep on sealing everything off and reorganizing it until, um, so this thing could, instead of calling this bad layer decks, um, we could call it, uh, bad lay decks, right? Bad lay decks. Uh, lay decks does mean layer index, but we need to make it more terse so that we can keep on doing this. And it looks like we have just enough room to do this. So, now this assert here, uh, this assert can only exist if it's C99 code. So I'm going to guess this whole section, yeah. This whole section is if it's not, not OpenGL. So that assert made me do a double take, but that's okay. Um, we've proven to ourselves uh, previously that that is okay with the way you wrote this. Um, and so now we're kind of here, the configuration pixel is never a valid location for storing data. So that's fine. Let's uh, change this commentary around though. So um, so what it's saying is that 
Let's let's look at this for a second. Uh, <coughs> so we have these different origin locations. Um, and if the origin location is not one of these origin locations, then we're saying that maybe we're looking at the configuration pixel. Um, oh, no, these are configuration pixel locations. Never mind. Um, so we can make a note of that, right? So we can go one, two, three. And we note that uh, right next to here is going to cause a problem. So we got to go one, two, three, four. And then over here, we're going to make the same kind of comment, multi line comment style. And then we can also kind of notate what's going on here. So uh, configuration pixel is never, never valid location for storing data. Never valid data storage location. <clears throat> right, and then we can make a little note here at vid iid 0, 1, 1, 2. And the time, we'll use t for time because this needs to be a little bit terse. 0, 2, 30, and 42 because we want to be cool. So let's re explain this for the camera right here. Uh, this right here. The configuration pixel is never a valid data storage location. So we're talking about these four pixels right here, these four pixel locations. And if we want to look at a diagram for where that is, we can go open up Paint 5D uh, data. So if we look at Paint 5D data, there should be a diagram in there. So Paint 5D data. And this diagram right here, we have a configuration pixel down here and one down here, and one down here, and one down here. It's it's actually these, like, um, and those pixels, uh, they're never valid origins, right? So we're just trying to make sure that, uh, I don't know, these origin locations, these are like origins of some blocks of pixels or whatever, and these origins can never be at the, at the, um, at the uh, map to the configuration pixel. And actually, I think I'm wrong about that. So we see 256 and 512. Nope, that's 256 and 512. So it is it is in terms of this coordinate space. Uh, we also can have mappings. Yeah, because because if we if we're looking at the little corners on here, the corners like here and here and here on the canvas user view, um, that those coordinates are actually valid coordinates to set stuff, right? Because every one of these pixels needs to be rendered to screen. Okay. So that makes sense. I'm satisfied with that, that explanation. So let's kind of continue, kind of sealing this off. And uh, you are, you are, uh, I, I think that might have said, uh, should have been on, but just say, you know, on config pixel. Um, and we could say on, on CFG picks. It's a 2021, right? So we're on the configuration pixel. We can call it CFG Pix, like that. It just needs to be a unique message. Like all it really needs to be is a unique message. So we're gonna hope that this is this base message is unique enough for the entire year. Is what we're gonna hope there. Um, that's not necessarily how it's gonna work, but that's what we're gonna hope. So let's keep on doing this, and let's just remove that and blah blah blahs things and things and um actually i kind of like that space to because we kind of this signature here we kind of like wanted explanations as to what everything was and everything kind of got a little crazy over here where it's like um we're sealing this off just got kind of difficult so uh, let's change this comment style to give us some more room. Now the problem is if we change this comment style to give us more room, uh, we, we still have a problem because the comment style, we don't want it to touch this. So maybe we could do this. Maybe we could make the comment style like this. And, and just say, and just be good with that, right? Right, just do 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 something like that. Like that might be a little bit better. Um, right, like something like that. All right, that won't give us problems. Okay. 
keep on going, and then we got some some ridiculousness over here where it's like, what's going on here? I don't know what's going on here. Um, let's just let's just double slash. Let's let's be lazy here and just do this, right? We just need some type of delineation that tells us that this code is kind of sealed off. That's all we really need. So, um. So let's keep on doing that and not worrying too much about it, right? <clears throat> and we can keep on doing this. Luckily, we're not doing OpenCL code, because OpenCL would not allow us to do this kind of like uh, C++ style comments of slash slash. We'd only be able to do star slashes, and then we wouldn't be able to do any of this. Any of our, any of our section dividers wouldn't actually work. So actually, yeah. Actually, I could never be able to compile as C89 just because my style... Uh, would not allow for it. Um, but yeah, let's um, take the easy route here and just try to, like, be like, hey, you know, as long as we can get two slashes in, we're going to be good, right? So two slashes is good enough for me. Um, so now we got to look at this local whatever the heck um, something. So we got to figure out how to shorten this. Um, my solution... Um... I think it's just like a... Well, actually, we could just change this to ASS for assert. Right? Yeah, there we go. That's the easy. That's the easiest solution. Uh, we could indent this as well. Like, if we want this to line up like that, sure, why not? Um, and then keep on going down to here, and it looks like this error message needs to be a little bit shorter. So, local TXY out of bounds 2021. Um, so I know we have the date, but let's just put this here like this. And that is something that seems like kind of generic, but it's good enough. It's good enough for our purposes. Let's keep on going down here. Um, let's keep on going down. Let's just see if we can keep on div putting these lines here. And see if that just can get us all the way through here without too much trouble. Okay, and then we have this thing here, which is not... So, we need to change the namespace for this, I think. No, this is called OpenGL Paint 5D, and we'd only be changing it to, like, uh, AAC 2020. Uh, the namespace wouldn't get any shorter, would it? Um, yeah, the namespace would not get any shorter. Uh, we could do some fancy macro magic, but for now we're just gonna we're just gonna say, oh, that's just that's just too long, and there's nothing we can do about it. Oh well. Uh, input checks. Um, so I is for input checks. So how about put a little I there, right? Why not? Get a little designy. And go down to here. Uh, tile value slash tool val. I'm just gonna call it TV slash. Yeah, I'm just gonna do that. Uh, I use these abbreviations enough that that's fine. So this is comment out. Glock picks not needed. OpenGL Paint 5D get function handles calculation of that. So we said this is not needed. We commented out. Um, that's great and all. Okay, sure, that's great and all, but um, what about my column limits here? Glock picks not needed. Uh, so, sure, we could do that. And... One, two, three, four, five. I don't know. I'm just feeling like writing five things in a row here because of the one, two, three, four, five, six, or is it six that we wrote? Is it six? Yeah. So, whatever. We can. 
So, we just want to make this kind of, like, look like it's... We want the, uh... Right, there's that term, I think my boss called it... My boss from old company called it Ragged Right. Well, we're trying to get rid of the Ragged Right, right? We're trying to get rid of the Ragged Right so we can just say, Hey, this code is completely done. And it is time-consuming, but... Um... I don't actually plan on ever touching this code again, right? And if I do touch it again, I want to see... I want to actually see the visible disaster that results in, um... when touching this code again. If that makes sense. One... One, two, three, four, five, six. Um... One, two, three... One, two, three... Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so it will be kind of like a... Okay, so there we go. We get all the way down here. And so, yeah, we, did, we didn't do a perfect job in terms of how we kind of sealed this off, right? Like, we did a lot of, like, hackish kind of ugly stuff. But now we have, like, everything has, like, this right justification here on it. Not all of it's as clean as, like, where, how we started. Um... But we got this nice little justification here to kind of seal it off like that. Let's uh, give it a run, make sure we didn't introduce any kind of compilation error. And I believe the tests are still turned on. I mean, that's going to be pretty obvious, right? So let's make sure the tests still pass for this code on the CPU side. And then we're going to cut paste this code into the shader code to make sure it still runs the shader code properly. And if that's the case, then we're ready to start kind of like shoving in um, more uh, GLSL code into the main function. Like I think we have like all the little tiny functions we need to get something rudimentary on screen in terms of the rendering. Now I could be wrong. I mean, there might be some more calculations we need here, but I think I got the basics down. So uh, we'll find out. Uh, now this is gonna take some time to run. So we're just going to hope that, um, um, also, I don't want to get stuck with the, like, every time I wake up, it's almost the next day, and then I have to do more push-ups right away kind of thing. So I think what we're going to do, too, is we're at three hours. I'm going to try to get more push-ups done as well. Try to get, like, it maybe, like, uh, technically, if we're doing 20 every hour, I technically owe 60 right now. Uh, I don't really feel like 60. But uh, technically, I don't feel like any exercise. I don't feel like doing any exercise. I don't feel like doing any programming. I don't feel like doing anything. But the idea is like, you know, sometimes you're not feeling motivated. You're not always passionate about your project. But you want to kind of crawl forward a little bit, like every every single day, right? Um, so, so that looks good. That looks good. It looks like our tests are passing. So now what we want to do is we want to take all this nonsense here. And we want to take it. And this is all this code right here. We want to take it all. I want to take it, copy it, and and really, um, if this was part of a build system, right, we would want to actually, all this cruft on the bottom and on the top, we would not want inside this file, right, because we're about to take this and cut and paste it. Uh, also, hold up here. I thought we, uh, I thought we kind of like put a divider thing here that was not to be changed. Now I look at this and I'm like, oh, what about this? This does not look like uh, we, uh, does not look correct. Um, so let's address that right now. Um, the best way to address that is if we get rid of this and we um, get rid of this and then we can put this, we can change this into a star right here. And then we can subtract that, and then we can uh, get rid of that right there, and we can put that there like that. And now we have enough room. Okay. Um, so I'm going to assume that that was a trivial change, and that nothing else broke, and that's a risk, because like I said, nothing, no such thing as a trivial... No, let's not risk it, because... The cutting and pasting is actually going to be quite time consuming, so. In fact, while this is running, right, so while this is running, um, while this unit test is running, uh, this P5D OGL test, that is actually testing this code. 
while that's running, we can actually start cutting and pasting this, right? So uh, we don't have to wait. We don't have to idle around. We can just let that run and then also kind of cut and paste, right? So we're going to take all of this cop. We're going to copy all of this stuff. Make sure that we copied from the beginning to the end. And then we're going to go into the um, Paint 5D shader string code here. And we're going to take all of this. Imagine if I didn't have copy paste. I would be. I wouldn't be able to program. I would not be able to. My workflow would be impossible without cut and paste. So, anyways, paste. After we've pasted, we're going to just wrap it in a gigantic string. Or uh, we're going to close this first. Okay. So, anyways, um, let's paste it again, just in case that we, in case we screwed that up for a second. Um, so, once again, we're going to paste it, and it's all kind of sectioned off now, right? And we're going to go through here, and we're just going to put it inside of a gigantic string, right? And this is the part that we think we can automate with some type of build system. But for now, I want to keep the build system kind of simple as possible. So we're just going to take all this code and uh, just, just do this to it, right? So, BAM! And then we got to go to this other side, and we need to do backslash. We need to do backslash n, right? So we got to go all the way up to the top, and column select. I would not be able to do this without column select either. Without like a proper column select, I'd be, I'd be up a creek as well. So then over here, we're gonna do backslash n, quote, and then bam. So now we got our new shader string. And so we're gonna hope that we haven't introduced any type of weird mistake into this code from our factor, right? Because our refactoring was supposed to be purely cosmetic, right? So that we could just be able to look at the code and see uh, where where code is basically finished, right? We wanted to delineate the right edge to say, hey, this code is finished. And then when we see this stuff over here in main, we see that the right edge is not sealed off. It's because this still needs work, right? We're like, we're not finished here, right? That's kind of what I want to say. So let's give it a run. Um, but before we give it a run, we need to go into the mod folder and delete the old shader. So we're going to delete this shader. And then we're going to go over here and we're going to run the script. And we also have, uh, right now we have the override to say that we want to, uh, override one means we're going to run all of the tests. And override negative one means we're not going to run any tests. So we're going to run all of the tests. And then after the test run, we'll be able to see if we get that magenta colored screen to confirm that the shader compiled. So let's give this a run. And then after that, I would say that I'm going to do some push-ups to get a head start on uh, when I wake up later. Um, I don't want to have to be like, oh god, I have like 100 push-ups to do and then just cram them again. I want to just be like, oh, only have a little bit to do and then, you know, I just don't want to how I don't want it to be like last time. So, so, so we're hoping that nothing has changed, right? We haven't done anything trivial. We have we've done haven't done anything kind of. I don't think we've done anything that would. First of all, we I know the tests are going to pass. Well, actually, I'm not sure I know that. Well, I'm fairly confident the tests are going to pass. The thing I'm most worried about is if we've made any stupid mistakes that make the GLSL not compile because. Um, GLSL is not something I write as often. Okay, so now we have to lazily invoke the uh, first shader. So this is about to freeze for a little bit. And we're now lazy. Now the, um, some more unit tests are getting lazily invoked. And maybe I should change how that behavior works. But, uh, <sighs> you can see kind of why I would do that. Because it took a long time for one of those tests to run and then this test, right? So, okay, cool. So that is that is compiling, right? Because we're getting the magenta screen rather than the syntax error screen. Okay. So we've we've got a good checkpoint here to where we have We've got everything ready for ourselves. We've set up everything nice and cleanly for ourselves to be ready to 
start adding to the shader code. So this fragment shader code, where we're at a good point where we're ready to write in here all, all the code. Now, it's not going to be all the code, so what we're going to do for this is the first shader iteration that we're going to write is just a shader where um, we don't do any camera controls. We just say that uh, we just try to render a 256 by 256 block of pixels. That is the canvas user view without any transformations applied to it, right? So we're going to try to render the entire uh, auto tile set using 256 by 256 pixels uh, within the viewport, and we're going to do that no matter what the size of the viewport is, which is not how the final renderer will look like, but we need to get some feedback, right? We need to we need to get some little small wins before we uh, move into the bigger wins. Okay, so that's what we'll do next time, I think. And um, what do we want to do next? I don't know what we want to do next. I think that that's kind of where I want to stop. Um, so three hours of not wanting to code is, I guess, a decent chunk of coding, though we did just a lot of uh, mundane stuff. But I guess, like I said, when I'm not feeling like doing stuff, it's actually that mundane, boring stuff, which is actually the best stuff. Um, which might seem kind of backwards, but the idea is that um, when you are not feeling motivated, there's you cannot force yourself to do creative work. Right? Like, you can force yourself to do push-ups, you can force yourself to shovel, you can force yourself to do dishes, but you cannot use... There's no pure willpower method to invoke creativity. So, mundane tasks, if you have mundane tasks that need to be done, then you can do those. So, um, you see, 110 was done today, but that was yesterday. That was because now today is... Uh, we've actually stumbled upon Thursday. So if we look at uh, the, not that screen, the break screen, I think, no, um, this screen here. Uh, the total today, that was Wednesday, so we're actually on zero. And we're actually on zero for here. And actually, you know what? Um, okay, if I get anywhere past 30, if I get 30, I automatically have to jump on the trampoline because you the week total is at 370. And anytime I go to hit 100, I jump on the trampoline just to save me some time to where I'm not constantly running out to the trampoline, like doing a few push-ups, running out of the trampoline, etc., etc. I thought it would make sense to batch that at every 100. Um, so that means, you know, if I my goal is 100 push-ups a day, and I only jump on the trampoline when I hit 100, then I only have to go out in the cold once per day. Um, but the thing is, is the thing is, is that um. 30 wouldn't be too hard to do right now, right? If we did 30, but then we also have to do our 100 jumps on the trampoline. Um, yeah, let's just do 30. Yeah, let's stop the stream, but let's mark this off, right? Let's. It's not much, but right, we want to nickel and dime ourselves into getting things done, right? So, um, so 30 is not much, but it's better than nothing, right? So, we're gonna, and that 30 is going to put us to 400. Right? And if that 30 puts us to 400, that means we have to do 100 jumps in the trampoline. So it's a trivial amount of push ups, I guess, but in terms of jumping on the trampoline, 100 jumps on the trampoline with how cold it is is actually a big deal. So um, let's. Uh, we're going to stop the stream here, but we're going to. Once we get off stream, we're going to do our 30 push ups. So that's what's going on. And I'll, uh, I'll see you later. So let's look at the uh, title screen here. So uh, Unit Test Manager. This wasn't really Unit Test Manager if we think about it. It was more like... Um, uh, it was Unit Test Manager. It was more like... Um, uh, uh, it was like... Um, uh, uh, shader... Misc shader cleanup. Really, really, what we just did was like misc shader cleanup, and um, hold on. Yeah, that's what we really just did was misc shader cleanup. That's kind of like what just happened, and we are on video forty-four. So the part forty-four is correct. 
but it was more of misc shader cleanup. Um, <clears throat> I really need to get better at labeling these things. But the most important thing is in the bottom right hand corner, you can see the integer ID video of the video is 112. I'm always getting that right, but all the other stuff I'm not. Um, so, you know, uh, this is misc uh, shader cleanup, right? So this was misc shader cleanup. That's what we just did. And um, this was video 112 for Wednesday. It's now Thursday at 2 a.m. And I'm going to get off here and do um, 30 push ups and 30 crunches, 30 squats, 30 dumbbells, and 100 jumps on the trampoline. So later.